Well, hello and welcome, everybody. Happy Monday. Uh, welcome to the Southside Beat. Uh, my name is Chris Halleck. Uh, Corey Christen not joining me today. Uh, Corey is on Pirates duty today. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, DK and uh, Taylor are both in Toronto covering the Penguins game tonight because Penguins are obviously in a in a big playoff chase. And um, so they're, they're tag team in that. And then, you know, Jose can't do everything when it comes to pirates. And so uh, he's getting a much needed breather. And so Corey's uh, tagging in on pirates. So I'm a uh, man in the ship today here. Uh, so hope you guys um, can, uh, can, can deal with that. <laughs> uh, but thank you guys for joining me. I, I know this is uh, a little bit later than we normally do, and it's probably not going to be as long of a show as we normally do, which I already know like 30 minutes is not typically that long. Um, but it's not going to be a very long show today just because we are getting a later start. Um, I, I know uh, I don't think there's a Ramon show today, um, but still we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to tackle a couple of subjects. But uh, getting a late start today because, well, I'm even wearing a shirt for it. Uh, yeah, today was the uh, – it's, I mean, it's still going on technically. I mean, but today is the uh, solar eclipse. And, uh, and Mark's asking, did you check out the eclipse? I absolutely did. So the town that I live in, you know, here in, in the Dallas area, um, well, all of the DFW area, I think, but especially if you're like a little East of Dallas, um, the, uh, the, uh, we were in the, we were in the path of totality. So, uh, this has been the first time in my life I've experienced it. Probably be the only time in my life I experienced it unless I go chase them whenever they happen. Uh, but that typically is not. <laughs> something that I do, <laughs> but, uh, no, it was, it was awesome, man. Uh, for, for those of you who have not experienced a, a total solar, solar eclipse before it is uh, really, really freaking cool. Uh, I, I can't, I can't, nah, I got, I got a couple pic I got a, a couple pictures of it on my Instagram. I got, a um, uh, I, I took a time lapse video of like before it, 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 it like passes, you know, like in front of the sun completely. So you get to see like how dark it ends up getting. And even then the phone really doesn't do do it justice. Uh, it is about as dark as like it is like right at dusk, like right when the sun kind of goes behind the horizon. Um, you know, not completely dark like it is at nighttime, but it, it's still freaking cool um and mark says bro that was crazy yeah it was it was awesome uh so i will um i am mr nick time here coming in said uh, the moan show is switching to wednesday uh wednesday only during the off season uh okay well there you go and i i mean i kind of understand it you know just because you know you know obviously dk doesn't just do steelers um you know so uh, especially like times like 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 this, you know, here in early April, you know, the Penguins are typically in the running for the playoffs. Either they've already clinched by by now, or they're uh, in the running for it. Uh, then to go along with that, you know, Pirate season begins, and there's usually always some sort of optimism at the beginning of a Pirate season. But when the team starts eight and two, there's even more optimism. Uh, and so, you know, DK is only one person; he can only do one thing at a time. So. Um, a spice creation says some places it got completely dark. I mean, like for me, it was so there was a pretty there was a good amount of cloud cover where I was. Um, so I mean, it got pretty dark. Like it was it was a lot like I mean, if if you would have just walked outside not knowing what time it was, you would have never guessed it was you know one forty five or one forty in the afternoon. It was it was. Yeah, it, I mean, it was. It, it felt like it was nighttime. The, you could feel the temperature go down um, a, a bit, maybe maybe a good 10, 15 degrees, maybe even more than that. I don't know, but you could definitely feel the temperature go down. It, it's really, it's really cool. <laughs> Jim said, maybe you could illustrate it like Madden did the sunset on Monday Night Football. I don't know about that, but I've got a time lapse on my Instagram of like, but as the moon passed into it, like it was like a wide shot, so you could kind of see like what the sky did as, as it, you know, as the moon passed in front. And then uh, I of course stopped because I wanted to take pictures. And then I, I did another time-lapse for whenever it went from totality back to, you know, it continued to pass through and it brightened back up. So um, yeah. And Mike, Mike, Mike says it here. It was kind of uh, eerie yet, yet awesome at the same time. Yeah, it was, it was, 
it was interesting. Like to me, it's awesome. I'm big time space nerd. I love talking about space and, 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 you know, anything to do with, you know, I, I do, I, I, I've done way too much, you know, reading about like the moon and the sun and stars and, I'm just a big space nerd. Anyway, we are over five minutes into the show. Haven't mentioned football almost at all. So let, let's change that. But it was really, really cool. And that's the reason why we're, we were late for the show today. Um, so, yeah, the title of today's episode, you know, some more draft draft talk. Uh, we're, you know, we're kind of in that, you know, I've talked about the, the, the off season has like two main dead periods. And, and, and you know, the first one is uh right after the super bowl so it's from the super bowl until um the the combine that that's kind of a, a dead period you know there's some coach hirings going on you know there might be a couple of um pending free agents that resign with their teams um so it's not completely void of news just same thing as right now it's not completely void of news um but that's a dead period and and then the real dead period is between mini camp and training camp uh, that month uh, is typically very, very quiet, the most quiet throughout the entire year, just because that's even when executives and coaches and everything are getting their vacations done uh, before the season starts. It's kind of the calm before the storm. But if there was a third dead period, it would probably be right now that gap between uh, the NFL annual meeting and then the draft. Um, there's still stuff going on. There are pro days, you know, the finish wrap, you know, wrapping up. Um, players that are doing individual workouts for teams, uh, that's going on right now. Like for example, today, uh, Cooper DeGene, uh, did his for teams and tested really, really well. I think he ran like a four, three, four in the 40 or something like that. I, it was like his overall test numbers were, were very, very good. Uh, if he would have put up those numbers at the combine, he, his stock might've gone up. Um, not that he's like a, like a, I think the only the only knock on Dujean right now is like where does he fit, you know how where does he play in the NFL, you know, um, yeah, but you know he worked out today, put up some really good numbers, um, so there's there's that stuff going on. Pre draft visits are going on, and here later today I'm I'm gonna put up a, um, a an updated list. I put up a list like a week ago or something like that, uh, but I'm gonna put an updated list in our Steelers feed of all the players that have visited. Uh, or are at least still scheduled to visit. Uh, that includes the local visits. Rem remember, local visits don't count towards the 30 allotted pre-draft visits. So you get like 30 visits, but then you can also visit with local uh, schools, like obviously for the Steelers, you know, Pitt, Penn State, and West Virginia all fall in that category. So uh, players from any of those schools don't count towards that 30, so they can meet with those. And um, yeah, it, it's... Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm really, it, it's kind of, it's kind of a dead period right now, but you know, there's still stuff to track, still stuff to talk about. And, and really, you know, this is the time where NFL GMs, like specifically Omar Khan are gathering more and more Intel, not only on players, but they're paying attention to what the other 31 teams are doing too, because they want to be able to have a game plan going in, uh, to the draft, especially tonight, one of the draft, um, because, you know, just like they did last year, you know, they traded up for Broderick Jones, you know, they, they had an opportunity, you know, they will lay out, I mean, what seems like an endless number of scenarios for every position that they're willing to trade up to, you know, if, if, if the, the player that we want is available at this spot, this is when we need to make a phone call or, you know, or, or you already make those phone calls ahead of time and, and you say, Hey, listen, we might be interested in trading up what might be, you know, and you, you kind of get a feel for what spots you could possibly trade up to what spots you can't, uh, what teams might be willing to work with you, what teams might not. Um, and, and so you talk about trade up scenario, trade up scenarios, talk about trade down scenarios. The Steelers will also be fielding calls because they will be fielding calls from teams about possibly wanting to trade up to 20. If, if a quarterback falls and there's still one at 20, shoot, they might get phone calls and, and see what they could you know, possibly get. And so this is when they run through a number of different, you know, scenarios as well so that they can have a game plan going in uh, to know exactly what they want to do. Um, and, and here's like kind of, you know, a, a 
one of those scenarios that you know Mike brings up. He says, Chris, I'm sure you've covered this, but do you think that there's a, any possibility that they take Barton at 20 due to his versatility, or would they take Fuatanu if he's there? Um, now, now I, I do know that the tackle that the Steelers really like is Fuaga, and there was a, yet another uh, reporter that reported the same thing I've been saying for about a week now, if not longer, that the Steelers love Fuaga. I know that they do, and I think there's now been two people who have said that, or at least one, or like two other reporters who have said that. So, you know, I, I just continuing to to you know you know. I'll continue to drive that home. You know, they really love Fuwaga. And so not saying that that's like the guy that they're dead set to get, because again, you know, he may go at ninth overall or something like that. And he's completely out of the Steelers range. Um, I, 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 and Mark even says it here. Like I saw a mock draft on NFL network yesterday um, with Fuwaga going to the Steelers at 20 with all the quarterbacks getting drafted beforehand. Yeah. If Fuwaga is there at 20, you run, you run to the podium. Like it's not even a question, uh, especially with wh- how I know the Steelers like him a, a lot. Uh, that pre-draft visit went very well. Um, if they have the opportunity to get him, they'll get him. But to go back to Mike's point about Barton, um, I just first off, I don't see a center at twenty. Uh, I just don't. Not not with the prior. Not with the priorities that have that have been put in place at, at tackle. Um, I might, I might not be able to say what I know specifically until after the draft. Um, but again, just some things that I know that I can't, that I've been sworn to secrecy on, um, like tackle is the priority. And again, it, that, that doesn't mean they're dead set on tackle in the first round. Again, you can't go in completely handcuffing yourself saying it's tackle or nothing else in the first round. Like, obviously you have to have some flexibility. And so that is where you begin to entertain, uh, you know, positions that you you could possibly address center is one of them, you know, and and you possibly could. Um, I do think to your point, Mike, that I do think that Graham Barton has actually gone up. Um, a phone call for my mother. My, my, that might be about the eclipse. <laughs> I'll call her back. Um, and so I think that there are some that are thinking that I think that there are some that are thinking that Grant Barnes actually ahead of Jackson Powers Johnson right now in terms of like the big board when it comes to centers. Um, his versatility might be one of them because obviously he he didn't play center at, at Duke. You know, he he's he's transitioning you know to the interior most likely at center and so um and uh yeah i i i I, obviously the 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 concerns that are floating around out there about jackson powers johnson's you know medicals and stuff like that i think that's another reason why so it's like a combination of those things and so that might put graham barton as like the first center you know uh, on some people's boards that being said, I, I still don't think that center is what the Steelers are looking at at 20. I think if I think the most likely scenario is that they stand pat at 20. But if you're asking me, and I've been asked, and I'll I'll continue to to answer that with you know, as I you know continue to gather more intel. That you know, if I'm asked if it's more likely the Steelers trade up or trade down, I, I think it's more likely that they trade up. And it's again, I think they have their eyes. Fuaga is not the only tackle that they like. I know that. I, I I am very inclined to believe that they also like J.C. Latham as well out of Alabama. Um, so I, 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 there are a few tackles that I think they're really eyeing in terms of guys that they might be willing to, if they can find the right trade partner and possibly trade up, I think there's a few, uh, maybe a couple tackles, or maybe there's only one tackle. I, I know who they like. I just I can't tell you how much they like them in terms of how much they'd be willing to trade up to get one of them. You know, it might be a situation where, you know, as we've you know, mentioned before, that if if Fuaga is there at 15, they might be like, no, we're pouncing on that. Um, but it might be a situation where they're, they're like, we're not willing to trade up to get a guy like Fuaga until unless he's available at 17 or 18. 
Um, I, I don't know. You know, and they and they obviously they won't tip their hands on that either, not to anybody. Um, so I, I think I think tackle. Um, tackle is the priority in the first round. There's a couple of guys that they want. I don't. I just don't see center playing out at twenty. I just. I just don't. I'm not saying it can't happen because you never know how the draft's going to fall. Um, but and, and here you go. J the best thing that can happen for the Steelers is what Jim says. Uh, you know, cross your fingers that there is a run on quarterbacks. That's what you want. You want. You want four or maybe even five quarterbacks. I think there's four for sure. But you want at least four quarterbacks being taken, for, you know, early on, you know, because the the more quarterbacks are, the more positions that are taken outside of tackle and center, or tackle and corner, or tackle and receiver, the more of those guys that are taken ahead of the Steelers picking are the earlier in the in, in the draft, the better for the Steelers because that gives them more flexibility to possibly get guys that they really really want. So on my mic uh you know randy says you know i like looking back on draft classes there are a lot of misses there are there's nobody here left from from the 18 or 19 drafts nobody uh the last two from either one of those drafts were mason rudolph and deontay johnson and they're both obviously gone so there's nobody here from and those you know obviously everybody from those classes would have had to sign a second contract uh and deontay did you know they, they did you know you know, if they hadn't traded him, he he would still be here, but he'd be the lone guy left. Uh, and they would have also had to re-sign Mason Rudolph. And the thing is, they already re-signed Mason Rudolph. Um, but those guys are still, they're not here. You know, you go to 2020, you know, I, I, I can probably pull up, um, you know, other draft classes too. Um, I probably have to do it on my phone. I'm on my old computer and the, the keyboard doesn't like to work completely. Um, but you know, I can go, you know, Steelers draft classes year by year. Um, and yeah, it, it, it can it can be it can be really uh really depressing to go through recent seasons and see, okay, you know, here we go 2020. Uh, Chase Claypool not here, Alex Highsmith still here, Anthony McFarland not here, Kevin Dotson not here, Antoine Brooks Jr. not here, Carlos Davis not here. So Alex Highsmith is the only one left from 2020. Uh, 2021. Um, you still got a few left, you know, Najee, Fryermuth, Dan Moore and Isaiah Loudermilk are all still here. Um, but Dan Moore might be gone, you know, eventually at some point, uh, Loudermilk is, um, about as far down on the, on the depth chart as you can get. Maybe the only guy lower than him is De DeMarvin Leal. Um, but you know, really the only two guys from that draft class, which was just, you know, two draft, three draft classes ago. Uh, the only two guys that are really worth anything are the, the guys from the first two rounds. Uh, you know, Kendrick green got traded away. Buddy Johnson, not, not here. Quincy Roche, not here. Trey Norwood, you know, was okay. You know, and then Presley Harvin, you know, they, they had to get rid of him. Um, you know, still some guys from 2022. Obviously, they traded away Kenny Pickett. George Pickens still here. DeMarvin Leal, I mean, in the doghouse right now. Calvin Austin, jury's still kind of out on him, but still kind of unproven. Obviously, the the, the being missing his entire rookie year was was not good. Uh, that, that you know, that's it's injuries. You know, you can't control that. Um, you know, Connor Hayward. You know, okay, you know, sixth round pick. Mark Robinson, seventh round pick. Not you know, kind of lived up to being a seventh round pick right now. And then Chris Oladokun didn't even break camp with the team. Um, so, I mean, draft classes before last year. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's very underwhelming. <laughs> I mean, I, I think if you were to go, you know, go a little further back, if you were to go to like, right, right as the Steelers were going, you know, heading into, you know, their success, that they had in the, in the, in the mid to late two thousands, you know, you were to go through and you were to look at some of these draft picks, these draft classes, you'd be like, man, a lot of those guys ended up like the 2002 draft class, dude, listen to this. Kendall Simmons. Okay. He was a solid guard, not a great first round pick, but okay. Antoine Randall L played a role on, you know, two different teams, you know, through the touchdown pass to, to Heinz Ward in Super Bowl 40 played in Super Bowl 45. Um, 
you know, Chris Hope, you know, he was a decent safety. Uh, Larry Foote, you know, he was part of that 05 team, that 08 team. You know, Veron Haynes, again, another solid role player. Lee Mays, okay, receiver, but sixth-round pick, you know. LeVar Glover, you know, okay, you know, seventh-round pick. But then seventh round, they found Brett Kiesel. You know, that that's, you know, and then 03, they only had five draft picks in 03, but Troy Polamalu was in the first round, and then Ike Taylor was in the fourth round. Ike Taylor has been the best cover corner this team has had since Rod Woodson. And still really like until Joey Porter Jr. And even then I, I don't want to put, I don't want to put Joey Porter Jr. In that class just yet. He, he did just finish his rookie season, but with five draft picks, they got a hall of famer and then a really, really, really good cover corner. Like, wow. <laughs> I mean, these guys were like significant contributors, you know? Yeah. You just, you go through, you know, those draft classes. And again, you go through most of those draft classes. They weren't picking high, you know, Oh five Heath Miller, first round, one of the team's best tight ends of all time. Uh, second round, Brian McFadden, good corner, Trey Essex. Okay. Solid tackle. Not great. Not bad. Um, you know, Chris Kimoyatu in the sixth round, you know, wasn't a great guard, but was still on an offensive line that won a Super Bowl. Um, you know, and that was, you know, that was the 05 draft class. So that was after they had gone a season where they went 15 and one and lost in the AFC championship. So they were picking 30th in the first round. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, like you go through these draft classes, man, like, 07, Lawrence Timmons first round, Lamar Woodley second round, Matt Spay third round, William Gay in the fifth round. Like these these guys, they were all contributors. They were all contributors, man. Like it it's been, it's been, it's the recent run of draft classes has been pretty awful. You know, uh, all, all things considered. Now, granted. Najee Harris. I mean, I think if Najee Harris has a better offensive coordinator and has a better offensive line in front of him, I think Najee Harris is one of the top five running backs in the league. I'll just put it, I'll just put it that way. I think he's capable of being that kind of a guy. I, I just I just think he is. He doesn't have a he hasn't had a lot of room to run. Um, I think the Steelers found something last year when it came to whenever they switched to more gap uh concepts when he was running behind power that dude was running with a 75 percent sex success rate dude <laughs> mark says thank you kevin colbert let's not forget how good he was yeah and here recently a lot of people have been really crapping on kevin colbert for his recent years of draft classes and i understand that and, and there's not it's not without criticism but yeah go back and look at those 2000 those draft classes in the 2000s a lot of those guys, a lot of those guys ended up becoming significant contributors. Like obviously your first round picks. I mean, but, but, but even then, you know, you go to the first round picks, let's go through first round. Let's go through first round picks in the last let's go. Okay. Let, let's, you know, this wasn't necessarily the plan for today, but you know, let's, let's go, let's go back for the last 10 years. Okay. We'll go in reverse order. Broderick Jones, okay, jury's still out. Kenny Pickett, traded away. Najee Harris, probably get his fifth-year option picked up. Probably, don't know for sure. So that's three years. Uh, Chase Claypool. Oh, sorry, no, sorry. I read it at the top. 2020, Chase Claypool was second round. 2020 was uh, traded away the first-round pick to get Minka. Okay, so that's the best use of a first-round pick so far, and we're going back. We're already four years back. It's trading away a first-round pick to get an already established NFL player. 2019, Devin Bush. Okay, this is this is not good. One, two, three, four, four. That's five years. So let's do five more players. Terrell Edmonds, not a good first-round pick. That's six years. Seven years back you get, is when you finally hit on one where you're like, okay, that's a first-round pick. TJ Watt. I, I mean, dude's going to probably be in the Hall of Fame. He's already maybe can already can be considered the greatest pass rusher in Steelers history. 2016 already burns. 
2015, Bud Dupree, another guy, you know, became a solid player, but first round pick? No, not really. 2014, Ryan Shazier. Okay. So out of that run, you've got two slam dunks, and one of them you got some bad luck on. TJ Watt and then Ryan Shazier were slam dunks. And those guys were picked at 15th overall and 30th overall. Um, you know, a couple of other solid uses of, of, of first round picks. I'd, I'd put Najee in that category. I know people are like, oh, well, you, a first round, you know, first round pick on a running back. That's not good. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And, and then, you know, trading one to get Minka, that's a good one. But then there's a lot of busts there, man, in terms of what you should be getting for a first round pick. I mean, flat out busts on Artie Burns and Devin Bush. And I even put Kenny Pickett in that category right now, too, because he traded him after two seasons. Especially because he's a quarterback. Position matters here. Um, But then let's just go th- through the 2000s. Let's go 2000 to 09. Plexico Burris, solid pick. Not great, but not bad. Casey Hampton, great pick. Kendall Simmons, solid pick. Troy Polamalu, slam freaking dunk. Ben Roethlisberger, slam freaking dunk. Heath Miller, slam dunk. Oh, uh, San Antonio Holmes, I mean, won a Super Bowl MVP, so I'm going to call that a slam dunk too. Lawrence Timmons, maybe not quite a slam dunk, but a really, really good pick. Rashard Mendenhall, solid pick. Ziggy Hood is 09. That's the first one where you're kind of like, meh, meh. But even then, he wasn't bad. He was kind of in that Bud Dupree era or area of became a solid player, but not quite lived up to the first round. And then 2010, Marquise Pouncey, slam dunk. 2011, Cam Hayward, slam dunk. 2012, David DeCastro, slam dunk. I mean, God, from 2000 to 2012, your first round picks, you didn't have a miss. There wasn't a miss for a, in a 13 year span drafting matters man it does and that's why i think there's so much emphasis on what do the steelers do in the first round like yes you have to have good draft classes overall you know you have to have good draft classes overall you need to be able to find guys in the second round in the third round in the fourth round and it really helps if you find a brett kiesel in the seventh round every now and then you know really really helps but those guys aren't guaranteed and when you do hit on them phenomenal great um like to me ike taylor in the fourth round that's that's freaking awesome um so i i i I think steven says i hate that ziggy ziggy hood pick yeah but again you put it in the context of a 13 year run that might be your worst first round pick it's not devin bush (laughs) <laughs> it's not already burns. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that run right there, that, that, that's a, that's a heck of a run of first round picks right there. I mean, multiple hall of famers, a super bowl MVP. And then and, and a potential, you know, a p- potentially another future hall of famer in cam Hayward. Marquise Pouncey, one of the outside of Dermani Dawson and Mike Webster, the best center in Steelers history. I mean, top three center in Steelers history, only behind Dawson and Webster. And Jim's, you know, you know, put it right here. That's what's killing us right now is the recent misses throughout drafts. I, yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 true. The drafts, the draft classes have to be better. And unfortunately, you know, last year looks like a really good class. It, it really does. Broderick Jones looks a lot of promise there at tackle. Um, Joey Porter Jr. You know, was a was a rightful nominee for you know rookie a defensive rookie of the year. Uh, wasn't going to win, but he but with what he did to earn a nominee a, a nomination for it, absolutely, one hundred percent, he should have been a candidate for it. Um. You know, Keanu Benton, you know, showed a lot of promise. You know, 
you can't judge these classes after one year. You got to give it a couple more years before you can go like, okay, that was a good class or that wasn't a good class. Right now, it looks like a good class. Let's see where they are in a couple of years. You know, we're three years into this thing. And if all four of those, if, if, if Broderick Jones, Joey Porter Jr., um, Keanu Benton, and one of anybody else, Darnell Washington, Nick Herbig, anybody else, and they're all significant contributors on this team, or any of them become like pro bowlers or all pros, that's a slam dunk of a of a of a draft class. Um. Yeah, it's. Let's see. I'm going through the comments right now. You guys are you guys got some good stuff in here. I'm trying to trying to. Yeah, uh, Brian says 2014 good draft. Bad luck with Shazier to it and Bryant and see that. See that's the other thing is that there's also been some bad luck that the Steelers have, have had to deal with. Specifically, the two two of you two that you mentioned in Shazier and Tewitt. We actually mentioned this, I think, la- last week on the show. You know, obviously, the, the Shazier, it's a freak accident. It happens, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but it's a freak accident that could happen at any moment and it happened to the Steelers. And in my opinion, took them from being a Super Bowl contender to, well, obviously not one. Um. But Stephon to it, that had a ma- that had a massive ripple effect because the Steelers had to choose between to it and Hargrave. They couldn't pay them both. They had to choose between they chose to it. And, and it was probably the right choice based off of cost, based off of contract status, everything like that. They chose to it and the rest is history. Um and Chris, Chris, you know, says why I don't understand. You know, Chris says why don't I, what I don't understand is why as a collective we only judge drafts by the first round. I don't, I'm not doing that right now. I'm just giving. It, I mean, I could sit here and go through every single pick for in that 13 year span, but I'm just saying, like, and I, I mentioned a few of those other guys. You know, like Taylor in the fourth round. You know that that's a Brett Kiesel in the seventh round. You know, they found guys later in the draft who ended up being contributors. Um, you know. Were there misses there? Absolutely. Second round of 2008 was Lima Swede. <laughs> I mean, the, there were some misses. You know, that 08 draft doesn't look so great now. Rashard Mendenhall in the first round. Okay, we know the long-term effect of that. It wasn't a bad pick, but, you know, obviously we know that after Super Bowl 45, everything fell off a cliff. You know, Lima Swede didn't work out. Bruce Davis. Anybody remember that? Linebacker Bruce Davis. Anybody remember him? I don't. Uh, Tony Hills, tackle. Dennis Dixon, quarterback. Um, uh, I mean, Ryan Mundy in the sixth round, I uh, like, it's not a good pick or it's not a good, that, that's not a good draft class. That was Oh eight. You know, that wasn't a good draft class. Um, you know, they found my, okay. Oh nine. They found Mike Wallace in the third round, Keenan Lewis in the, in the third round. Um, those are a couple of good picks. Um, you know, it, those, uh, I think, okay. Chris, I think you're actually bringing up a guy that uh, says Jermaine Stevens. And uh, yeah, that was the, the last tackle they had taken. And yes, I do remember. I, I was, uh, it was 1996, first round pick. That was the last time before the Steelers took Broderick Jones that the Steelers had taken a tackle in the first round. Um, so... <laughs> I bring up Lima Swede and comments already start. I remember Lima Swede dropping that touchdown in the AFC Championship game. I think everybody does, man. Uh, he kind of made amends for it a little bit, a little bit later by laying that Heinz Ward esque block that would absolutely be one hundred percent illegal right now. That was Lima Swede's mark on Steelers history. Was the mark on that he left on that dude? I think it was Corey Ivy. I don't remember who it was, but that dude's helmet. That was that mark was the left that he made on Steelers history. Was that one block in the AFC Championship game? Um, but yeah, I, I no ju- first draft classes are not judged solely on first round picks. They they can't be. But what you do with that first round pick does kind of set up for what you do for the rest of the class. And it does kind of mean the most because it's the biggest investment that you're making. Those are the best players that are available in the draft class. And you're never going to bat a thousand on those guys. But I just went through it. I just rattled off a 13 year span in which there were no 
swing and misses. There were no Artie Burns's in that. There were no Devin Bushes in that. Uh, th- th- there was nothing. Um, there was nothing missed. A couple of picks where you're like, okay, didn't live up to the hype of a for, or, or to the to the value of a first round pick, but became a solid player. You know, Richard Mendenhall falls in that category. Ziggy Hood falls in that category. You know, but there were, like I said, multiple Hall of Famers: Troy Polamalu, Ben Roethlisberger. You know, another one was a, was a Super Bowl MVP in San Antonio Holmes. Like you know, other guys who played critical roles on the team. You know, Casey Hampton. You know, like the, the these guys, man. That's a thirteen year span. That, if the Steelers have that kind of a span right now, they're in a much better position. You know, yeah. And, and Joseph brings up, yeah, Pouncey, like Cam Hayward. David Castro, like it's just that's it's. I mean, it's hit, hit, hit. Like <laughs> there's no misses in a 13 year span. That's amazing. That's one of the reasons why the Steelers have had the success, had the success that they had, and it's one of the reasons why that success continued to carry over. Whenever things went from uh, from Bill Coward to Mike Tomlin, now I know there's going to be a lot of people that don't that don't agree with that. There's going to be people that say, well, Mike Tomlin only won because he inherited Bill Cowher's team or Bill Cowher's players and everything. I wholeheartedly disagree with that, but um, it's why they were able to continue to, to, to have the, have the success that they had. And then when they had to start rebuilding the defense, Mike Tomlin kept the team afloat without ever, without having to have any seasons where they went four and 12 or three and 13 or five and 11 or anything like that. You know, he was able to rebuild a defense while the offense was amazing. And, you know, continue to have that franchise quarterback that was in his prime playing phenomenally and was able to rebuild a defense. You know, there were a couple, obviously, some disappointing seasons in there, which in which they went eight and eight. And there were some seasons that they underachieved. There's no denying that either. Um, and I think Mike Tomlin would be the first one to tell you that. Again, go back and watch his press conference at the end of the season, and you'll see the the – how contrite he was about, you know, a guy like Marquise Pouncey never winning a ring, you know, um, you know, my, my, Mike says, you know, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Colbert came out recently and admitted they may have made some mistakes in his refusal to adapt to changing styles. I think one of the reasons that I think the Steelers, I think one of the reasons why the Steelers have had some bad, bad from my perspective, they they may say differently, but it looked like they were drafting for need rather than drafting the best player available. Perfect example is 2022 Colbert's last draft. You know, they take Kenny Pickett in the first round, and I think it's because whether Kevin Colbert admits this or not, I think it's because Kevin Colbert didn't want to hand over a completely empty quarterback room to Omar Khan. And so the, you know, with the moves made, he handed over Mason Rudolph, then Mitch Trubisky signed in free agency. And then Kenny Pickett drafted, you know, if if things work out with Penny, Kenny Pickett, then great. But if you don't feel that he's the, the best player available, when, when the, you came up, when, when you were on the clock at 20th overall, that's not a good draft pick and it didn't work out. You know, not we can say that in hindsight now, but the shoot, like even before he was traded, I I definitely was given my concerns based off of what I've seen over two seasons worth of tape. That dude, he's got some serious issues with his game that will absolutely keep him at a like he cannot get above a certain level if he doesn't fix some of these things. And the fact that they sign a, you know, they sign, to, you know, one quarterback. They, tr- they, and then looks like that that guy's going to be possibly supplanting Pickett. And then Kenny asks for a trade. And so you move on. Um, this is asked earlier. And then I probably need to go ahead and run after this. But, uh, Steeler Girl asks, you know, Chris, in your honest opinion, how do you feel about the quarterback room right now? I feel better about it than I did at the start of the off season, to be completely honest. I think it's got a higher ceiling overall. 
There are some people that probably don't agree with that, and that's fine. Um, I, I think, number one, I think the floor is raised, which is why I think it's a better room right now. I think it's, I think, <clears throat> I think if, obviously, like, you could, bring up scenarios in which which both Russell Wilson and Justin Fields completely bomb and they both are just terrible then yeah you could probably be like okay that's a it's a bad but i think when you play the percentages Russell Wilson is going to provide better quarterback play than what the Steelers have had for the past two seasons even if it's not that much better it's still better and again uh, really quick, Carl asked no DK today. Uh, no, uh, the Ramon show uh, will be back on Wednesday. So, um, yeah, that, that's that's the the deal there. And, and even then, this show is running running late today because we started really late uh, because of the eclipse today. Boom! Total solar eclipse twenty twenty four. It was cool. I was a big nerd for it. Big space nerd. Um, but yeah, the quarterback room like. Again, Russell Wilson, if he is the same quarterback that he was in Denver, especially second season, it's better quarterback play than what the Steelers have had recently. Is it great? No. Is it? But Mason Rudolph pr proved down the stretch last year. You don't have to have some sort of Superman back there or Patrick Mahomes back there in order for this to be an amazing offense. Mason Rudolph was competent. There's, that, that's not an insult. He went back. He he dropped back. He sat in the pocket. He made his reads. He trusted his eyes. He made throws. Was he perfect? No. But was he efficient? Heck, yes, he was. Um, <laughs> the Jacob says, <laughs> started late because of the eclipse. What sense does that make? It means I was watching the eclipse out there, outside. <laughs> like I know totality was over before the show started, but man, like it was enjoy like literally like, by the way, I live in a town in which there was like, to like, it, it, like we're in the path of totality. My entire County is my County. The, the County that I live in expect was expected an additional 200,000 people. All school districts are closed today. Like nobody's leaving to go anywhere unless you want to get caught in insane traffic. So yeah, I was going to enjoy it, and I and I did. Um, but uh, Mike John saying, still loving the show though, brother. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, but even outside of Russell Wilson, you know, Jim says it here. You know, Fields is intriguing. Fields is very intriguing. If anything, I'm more intrigued by Justin Fields than by Russell Wilson, just because we know what we know what we know what Wilson is. First off, he's not the the guy that he was whenever he was in his prime with the Seahawks. So we know that for sure. He's not that guy anymore. Is he still athletic enough to make certain plays outside the pocket? Yes, he is. Does he? Can he still throw the deep ball? 100% he can. I've got a chalk talk on the, on the website right now on dkpittsburghsports.com. I got a chalk talk there. You can go over. You can find our you know weekly features. Click on chalk talk. The dude can still throw the deep ball. He's still very good at it. Um, but there are other parts of his game that are concerning. No, lack of use in the middle of uh, <laughs> Pittsburgh Hornets. Did you play Total Eclipse of the Heart? No, I did not. I'm not that corny. <laughs> um, you know, the concerns with, with Wilson, obviously, middle of the field usage. Arthur Smith uses it. Russell Wilson doesn't throw it to the middle of the field. Like, it's there are there are there are some issues that I'm concerned about. Um, but overall, Wilson raises the floor of the quarterback room. But then with Justin Fields, the ceiling is, you can't measure it. The ceiling is massive. The potential is off the charts. He can do, a, maybe only Lamar Jackson can do more with his legs in the, in the entire NFL. And then you add on top of that, that Justin Fields has a, a heck of an arm. He can make certain throws that are 100% can make him a, a dangerous NFL quarterback. He can make throws on the run outside the pocket. One in particular that I can think of, it was late in the season against Atlanta, running to his left. So he's right-handed quarterback, so running to his left, notices a guy break up, breaks off his route. So keeping his eyes downfield while running, 
notices his tight end, breaks off his route, throws back against his body. I mean, and it's a strike right to him. It's like those type of type of throws are very, very can be overlooked way too often. Those throws are special. He can throw the deep ball really well. Maybe not quite as good as Russell Wilson, but Justin Fields also throws a really good deep ball. The biggest concern with 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 Fields is is the turnovers. He's turned the ball over 41 times in 40 career games. That's alarming. <laughs> 30 interceptions and 11 lost fumbles. That's a lot in 40 games. So obviously, I think I think certain coaches will look at those situations. I think Arthur Smith and Tom Arth and Mike Sullivan and Mike Tomlin will all look at what Justin Fields is capable of and be like, we can do certain things to prevent th- those type of numbers in terms of turnovers. And if they can do that, then Justin Fields will become the starting quarterback before the end of the season because he's special enough. He's got the tools to become a dangerous quarterback in this league. The question is, can he continue to grow? Can he continue to move on and limit those turnovers, be able to play within the structure of the offense a little bit more consistently? It's it's his, it's the same thing that I harped on with Kenny Pickett. If he can begin to make throws, and when I say within the structure of the offense, I mean take the snap, make your reads, trust your eye, what Mason Rudolph was doing last year. If Justin Fields can do a little bit more of what Mason Rudolph did, in those final three games and then plus the playoff game, play within the structure of the offense and then combine that with his ability when things aren't there, be able to go outside the pocket, make special plays with his legs, be able to throw that deep ball. That's whenever he can take off and become a superstar. And Jim says it right here. If they can fix the turnovers, sign them long-term. He would be the long-term answer. Um. But the ceiling is massive. The the but there are absolutely concerns there. I'm not denying that at all. I'm not trying to give some sort of false security or false like a false sense of security security for you guys that the Steelers have magically figured out the quarterback situation. No, there are questions. There are questions. Hundred uh, percent. We probably need to. Um, Mike Mike says actually I I do have this. A little bit. I didn't go into full blown detail. Mike asks, I haven't paid enough attention to Fields' game. I know he's a cannon, but but how is his deep ball, ball accuracy? Um, I do have a chalk talk. It's from it's from maybe about a month or so ago. I was actually looking at Kenny versus Mason, and then outside, I looked at only Justin Fields because he was the most lo- like rumored guy. And <laughs> lo and behold, <laughs> he ended up getting acquired. Um, but I did look at Justin Fields' um. Deep, I think I think I have deep ball accuracy numbers in there. I think so. You might want to go back and look at that, possibly. Um, really quick, Pittsburgh Hornets. Do you think uh, asked? Do you think Mason starts this year? Obviously, that'd be in Tennessee. I think Will Levis gets the first crack at it, just because again, what they invested in in the draft pick. But can Mason Rudolph play better than him down the stretch? It's possible. It's possible. I'm not going to say he starts week one, but could he be the starter before the end of the season? Possible. And this is honestly a perfect way to wrap this, to tie a bow on this show. Michael says fields had no O-line in Chicago. And the one in steel town will be better. Um, That is why it is so important for the Steelers to get another tackle in the first round. Again, let's go full circle, full circle, bring this right back. Why the Steelers are prioritizing tackle, I think that's one of the reasons why they've got two quarterbacks right now who both hold on to the ball for a very long time. Russell Wilson and Justin Fields both hold on to the ball for a long time. They take a lot of sacks. It's imperative that they get another tackle because riding with Dan Moore and Broderick Jones is not going to work. You ride with Broderick Jones and Fuaga or lay them or any of those guys that they could possibly get them. And, and Brian even brings them up, you know, po- possibly uh Amarius Mims. You get one of those guys, man, that's better bookends on the offensive line. And plus, obviously that also helps the running game too. Not denying the fact that center is still a need. 
and we've hit on that plenty, but we do need to wrap this up. We're coming up on 50 minutes now. This is a long, this went way longer than I, I anticipated it to go. Um, but <laughs> James says, sure, the O-line and Chris could start a quarterback. No, you don't want me playing quarterback, I promise. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, yeah, you guys are awesome. You guys you guys bring it every single day. Thank you guys for the comments. Um, if you if you got a chance to see the eclipse today, uh I I you know awesome. I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um it was awesome. I nerded out big time. Uh, and if you did, man, like I hope you, I hope you get a chance to see one. I think everybody should get to see one at, at some point in their life. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's awesome. It, it is so cool. Um, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal just cause all oh, the moons just, just happens to be passing in front of the sun. It's like, I don't know. It was, it was awesome to me. Yeah. Mike, Mike, Mike Jones, he said, you got the full experience. Sure did. And I was, I was concerned because we had a lot of cloud cover here today. So, and, and we are getting storms coming later. Like, like here, I think it's like in two or three hours that we're supposed to be having those typical Texas storms that we get. So, um, and I won't miss those when I'm back in Pittsburgh, man. I know Pittsburgh's got its own weather issues, <laughs> but I will not miss the Texas storms that just randomly pop up. And it goes from 82 degrees and sunny and peaceful. And then 10 minutes later, it's like, oh my God, the world is coming to an end. Um, yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, whatever you're enjoying tonight, whether it's a Pirates game, you know, keep, keep cheering on those buckos. Enjoy them while they're good. Uh, don't know if it's, that's going to last for six months, but man, they're playing good baseball right now. So enjoy that. And then Penguins hockey tonight. I know that they're uh, obviously in a big playoff race right now. It's exciting. They're playing good hockey right now. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Enjoy it. Uh, we'll uh, we'll be back tomorrow uh, for sure. Uh, it'll be me solo again tomorrow. Corey is uh, covering the Pirates game tomorrow too. So uh, Corey will be at PNC Park doing his due diligence there, doing his work there. So it'll be solo me again tomorrow. Definitely will not be as long of a show tomorrow. Uh, we'll be back at the regular time, uh, 3 o'clock Eastern. Uh, and then, you know, my kids go back to school tomorrow. They, you know, again, the only reason they were out today was because like every school district in the area is closed because of the eclipse. So, um, they'll be back in school tomorrow. So obviously I got to run at a certain time, but, uh, appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, great show today. Uh, I definitely need more something, something to drink. My throat's already hurting from, from talking for 52 minutes nonstop. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. I can't say thank you enough. Um, love you guys so much. Catch you guys on the flippity flip. See you tomorrow.